charge of the psychiatry and law program um, in our department. So in the psychiatry and law program, we deal with civil cases and we also deal with criminal cases. So civil cases have to do with things like malpractice and personal injury. And in fact, tomorrow afternoon um, at the courthouse, we are having a mock civil trial. And I'd like to invite everyone to come. Um, it's done on Wednesday afternoon because that's when the judge was able to get a courtroom. Uh, the fellows, I have two fellows each year, and there are expert witnesses. The attorneys are um, uh, on the defense side. Um, uh, she is a partner in Hazard Bonington, which is the big psychiatric malpractice defense firm um, in San Francisco. And on the plaintiff side, it's one of the partners in a big law firm, Bertrand Fox and Elliott, who does a lot of the um, plaintiff work. And I told them that their job is to be, especially on cross-examination, as hard as they can be on the fellows because you don't learn anything um, unless you have a very difficult cross-examination. So if anyone is interested in attending, um, they should contact Sabrina Ho and she can give you all the information, um, the place and um, just how to get there. It's an open courtroom so people can walk in. The other part of forensics is criminal um, work and that's what we're going to hear about today um, in Grand Rounds. Um, Alan Newman is one of the faculty members in the psychiatry um, and the law program. Um, he is, um, since 2014, he's been the chair of psychiatry at Cal Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco, and he also serves as the director of residency training in psychiatry. In addition, he's an associate professor of psychiatry at the Dartmouth Medical School. So for those people who don't know, um, CPMC, of course they're not um, a medical school, but they have medical students come to CPMC from Dartmouth. So Alan coordinates um, their program um, in psychiatry. Dr. Newman attended medical school and residency at the University of Arkansas where he was elected to AOA. And then he also received many other honors. He was a Rappaport Fellow of the American Academy of Psychiatry and the Law and the Daniel X. Friedman Congressional Fellow where he served on the health staff of the U.S. Senate Committee on Labor and Human Resources. And these are very high honors in the field of forensic psychiatry and also for people who are interested in being involved in advocacy and legislation to work in one of the committees um, in Washington. Um, Dr. Newman completed his fellowship in forensic neuropsychiatry at Tulane. Um, he's board certified in both psychiatry and in forensic psychiatry. He was previously on the faculty at the Tulane Department of Psychiatry and Neurology where he directed medical student education as well as the fellowship in forensic psychiatry. Um, then he moved to Washington DC for nine years. He was an associate professor of clinical psychiatry at Georgetown and also directed both the general residency training program and the forensic psychiatry program. Um, he was recognized in 2004 as the best teacher in a forensic psychiatry fellowship program um, by the American Academy of Psychiatry and Law and is now on the executive um, he had served on the executive council of Apple. So when um, I heard that Alan was moving from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco, and then Alan contacted me, and um, he's just, as you'll see, he's a fantastic teacher. So the question was, how can he become involved in our fellowship? And so um, right now what he does in our fellowship is he does case conferences where he talks about his cases and he also leads the landmark case seminar for the fellows and the medical students. Um, just to give you an idea about what forensic psychiatry is on the criminal side, so what our job is is to try and understand the mind of people who have committed often horrible criminal acts. And if you, um, as I was looking at 
Dr. Newman CB, I just, you know, some of the cases that he's written about and have give presentations about gives you an idea about what forensic psychiatrists do. So he has um, written about the Leopold and Loeb case. How many people know what that is? Raise your hand. So only some people. So this was a very, um, I mean, horrible crime. There were um, two students at the University of Chicago who murdered a 14-year-old boy. And they did it in a very calculating way to show their intellectual superiority and also to try and commit a perfect crime. And that's why they murdered this person. And um, you know, they were arrested and went to trial. Well, Clarence Darrow um, was the defense attorney. And there are several movies that are made about that. Um, he has presented on Love and Death Behind Bars, The Manson Family at 50. I'm sure everyone um, remembers uh, Charles Manson. Um, gives a presentation. Um, he calls it The Devil Made Me Do It except he didn't. The puzzling world of false confessions, of false confessions of satanic abuse. And he's even written about Edgar Allan Poe, a psychological um, autopsy. But today we're in for real treat because Alan is going to talk to us about John Hinckley, as people remember and as you'll hear much more about. So John Hinckley um, attempted to assassinate President Reagan. Um, then for many, many years, he was at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, and that's where Dr. Um, Newman um, met him. And um, when he was there, he kept applying for release. Actually, he's recently um, been released. But part of the issue with release is, since he was found not guilty by reason of insanity, is, is he still dangerous? And so Dr. Newman was the consultant about trying to determine, is John Hinckley still dangerous? Um, or if he's not, then he might be safe to be released. So with great pleasure, Dr. Alan Newman. Good morning, and thank you, Dr. Linda. This is uh, very exciting to be here, and this is one of my favorite cases to talk about because this is sort of the case that probably got me into forensic psychiatry uh, as a medical student in Arkansas. Uh, Park Dietz, who had been the pro one of the prosecution experts, uh, actually came and gave brain rounds. And I, up to that point, I wasn't actually aware that there was this field um, where you could do this for a living, and it just was uh, astonishing to me, and uh, especially uh, having sort of come of age when this case was actually happening and uh, following it pretty religiously. So, um, and it actually is a nice case because it really does sort of capture uh, all of criminal forensic psychiatry in, in a nutshell. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. This is mostly a historical talk, but also about principles of the law, so I'm not going to be talking about uh, medications or off-label issues. Um, uh, there'll be a few historical meds uh, mentioned. Um, and, um, what are we talking about today? Well, we are going to talk about the insane defense, um, probably the most misunderstood aspect of forensic psychiatry. And if I can sort of um, demystify uh, some of the false aspects of the insane defense, that will be a win for the day. Uh, talk a little bit about sort of legal versus clinical definitions of mental disease. Um, different tests of insanity, what we call cognitive versus volitional tests, standards of proof, burden of proof. These are legal concepts but very relevant in the outcome of how these cases um, are perceived. A little bit about malingering in the insanity defense um, and probably whatever else uh, we have time for. Um, there should be plenty of time for some questions at the end. I want to start with the crime. I'm going to do a little flyover to D.C. Um, any of you been to D.C.? It's, you know, sometimes I get talks about obscure places, uh, you know, like Medina, North Dakota. Uh, but, you know, everyone's been to Washington, D.C. And if you're familiar with a neighborhood called DuPont Circle, just north of DuPont Circle is the uh, Hilton Hotel, which people still in D.C. refer to as the Hinkley Hilton. And it actually looks uh, almost identical to how I looked at the crime. This is the exact crime scene. The only thing that's different is they built this sort of portico, which is the exact spot where Reagan was shot, so that in the future, you know, cars can pick people up. So they figured out a way to prevent this exact same thing from happening in the exact same way, in the exact same place, in the future. 
So let's all feel safe. Because um, now they'll have to do it like a, a block away. Um, but at any rate, here's the video. And we're going to get to see the whole crime right here. surrounded by armed uh, security guards, it's not a highly secured environment, and very quickly you hear the shots fired. Um, President Reagan was shot. He actually was the last of the four people shot. Um, President, uh, uh, the presidential press secretary, James Brady, uh, was shot in the head, um, received devastating uh, a brain injury. Um, Secret Service agent Timothy McCartney uh, got a, an abdominal uh, shot, recovered fully. There was a D.C. police officer, Thomas Delahanty, who was shot in the neck, um, recovered with um, some disability and had to retire from the police force. And President Reagan, uh, the shot that hit him ricocheted off the presidential limousine, actually entered under his armpit. And initially, they did not actually think he was hurt. They pushed him in the car and they drove off. And um, he was complaining of some pain, and they thought it was maybe just from shoving him in the car. And it wasn't until a little bit, a few minutes later, where they really realized they had a serious situation. And uh, they took him immediately to the George Washington University emergency room, um, where he wound up getting uh, life-saving surgery. And because President Reagan recovered fully, I think people have kind of downplayed a little bit the seriousness of this. But this was modern medicine at work. Um, with the advantage of being able to be in an OR very, very quickly. And if you look at the four successful presidential assassinations, Reagan's injuries were actually worse than two of the four. Only President Kennedy's or the lethal headshot and President Lincoln, who also was shot in the head, were more serious. But, but the other two presidents who died of assassinations would probably have survived in this day and age, McKinley and, and uh, President Garfield. So this was a very serious injury that Reagan was very fortunate to survive. Um, the reporters were just standing there ready to ask him questions, and there's the man. He just was hanging out there uh, with the reporters, um, looking like he fit in. Now, who is this man? Um, well, the man is, you already know from the first slide, right? Um, John W. Hinckley, Jr. Now, who is this man? This is his uh, mug shot. Um, well, he was a man uh, that uh, immediately posed a mystery. Now, he was um, captured at the scene holding the gun, so there was very little question that he did it. Um, but as they began the investigation, um, they very quickly started to deconstruct that something unusual was going on here. Um, he had been staying at a hotel very uh, close to the shooting called the Park Central Hotel, which is uh, no longer in D.C. Um, and in his room, there were all sorts of materials that proved to be uh, of interest in trying to understand the crime. There were books written about things like skyjacking. There was a copy of a book, The Catcher in the Rye. Um, there were letters. There were newspapers. There was a newspaper that actually had Reagan scheduled for the day. Um, um, lots of poems, lots of letters. And significantly um, was what's been since called the Dear Jody Letter. So this was a letter that said, uh, Dear Jody, uh, there's a definite possibility I will be killed in my attempt to get Reagan. I would abandon this idea if I could only win your heart. I cannot wait any longer to impress you. I've got to do something now to make you understand. By sacrificing my freedom and possibly my life, I hope to change your mind about me. Give me the chance with this historic deed to gain your respect and love. All right, I see some people here under 40. So who knows who Jody is? 
Yeah, okay, right, right. We all know who Jody is. So, unfortunately for Jody Foster, this case uh, put her in the news. And, uh, and a lot of what made this case sort of famous was his obsession. Now, we know Jody Foster now uh, as a very serious, well respected um, Oscar. Uh, winning actress, but at the time of Reagan shooting, uh, Jodie Foster was really coming into her own uh, as an older teenager um, and was in, in some ways sort of uh, um, pursuing roles that portrayed her in a very different way. And John Hinckley had really gotten obsessed with the, the teenage uh, Jodie Foster who was uh, becoming a, a big star. Now, who is Hinckley is the real question, right? So, um, and naturally with a major assassination attempt, the government uh, did a very thorough investigation. He's been arrested. There's no investigation on, you know, who did the shooting. He did the shooting. Obviously, they wanted to see if he had um, any co-conspirators. But very quickly, the government focused on Hinckley himself. And so, the investigation of his childhood reveals some very interesting things, and this will give us some context into thinking about his mental state at the time of the crime. Um, he was born on May 29th, 1955. He was the youngest of three kids from a very successful family. His father owned a company called the Vanderbilt Oil Company. So right away, that makes him a little different than our average forensic case. He came from a wealthy family, a family that could afford a good lawyer for him. Um, father was the sort of self-made um, uh, millionaire. His brother was a, also very successful. He was already the vice president of the company. He had an older sister who was smart, popular, outgoing, married, had kids. Um, and John was kind of the, the screw-up of the family and really didn't achieve the way that his uh, siblings had. Um, now, he showed some promise early on. In elementary school, he was the quarterback of his football team. He was the best basketball player. In junior high, he was actually the class president in uh, seventh grade and ninth grade. Um, that was certainly not my experience. Um, quite the opposite. <laughs> I think there was one time they were running for like a council, and there's 12 spots and 13 of us running, and you lose. You know, so, you know, I reflect uh, that, oh, wow, this was a different kind of kid than I was. Uh, manager of the football team, and he got interested in guitar. And if anyone with children knows, that's usually where the trouble begins. Uh, <laughs> don't let your children learn the guitar. By high school, he was becoming increasingly reclusive. One of his classmates described him as a non-guy, um, just this sort of um, person that sort of faded into the background. Um, he rarely brought friends home. He spent time in his room listening to the Beatles, which was one of his favorite groups. Um, and here's his high school uh, yearbook photo. From ages 18 to 24, you're starting to see the development of the adult Hinckley and his, um, some of the aimlessness that's going on. He graduates from high school, and his family moves to Evergreen, Colorado, um, which is outside of Denver. And um, he enrolled in Texas Tech University in Lubbock, Texas, uh, where a lot of his family lived. Um, but his uh, college career was not very successful. Um, after his freshman year, he drops out. He moves in with his sister in Dallas. He returns in the spring semester of 1975, drops out again a year later. Um, and then things really start to go awry. In 1975, he moves to Hollywood with the intent to become a songwriter. And this is where one of the most significant events happens, which is the movie Taxi Driver came out. And he saw this movie taxi driver in the movie theater 15 times. Now, uh, again, for those of you under 40, um, in those days, you couldn't even rent a movie. You couldn't even get a cassette tape <laughs> to take it home. You had to go to the movie theater. Um, and so that's quite a commitment to um, you know, see a movie in the theater 15 times. Now, I can tell one or two of you probably saw Twilight in the theater about 15 times, but for most of us, you know, we wait till it comes out on streaming. So what, how many of you, have any of you seen the movie Taxi Driver? Okay, I recommend to all of you that you see Taxi Driver. Unfortunately, it's not on Netflix instant streaming. I just checked last night. But Taxi Driver is a fascinating story. It's not hard to get a copy of. Um, and it's about a taxi driver who's a Vietnam vet in New York in the early 1970s named Travis Bickle, who was played by Robert De Niro. This was a year or two after he got the uh, Academy Award for uh, Godfather II. Um, 
and he is uh, he has insomnia. He can't sleep, so he decides to uh, drive a taxi cab. And he meets this uh, political aide working for a presidential candidate named Betsy, who uh, is played by Sybil Shepherd. Um, and it's a it's a very uh, unfortunate pairing because she's smart and sophisticated and educated, and he's utterly clueless and really has no idea how to interact with her. Um, but during his driving as a taxi driver, he meets a young prostitute, a runaway on the street, a 12-year-old uh, named Iris, who was played by 12-year-old Jodie Foster. And he develops not a romantic, but a very parental interest in her and, and an interest in trying to get her uh, off the street. Um, as time progresses, uh, Travis um, becomes increasingly isolated, increasingly paranoid, starts to buy guns, starts to collect guns, and there's a very famous scene uh, in the movie where he's standing in front of a mirror and he's going, are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Well, I don't see who you're talking to. Are you talking to me? And it's been very, it's uh, emulated and, and sometimes uh, humorized, but to see this very uh, troubling, slow depiction of somebody uh, into this psychotic state is, is very disturbing. Um, Travis eventually um, appears to decide to assassinate the presidential candidate that uh, Betsy worked for, shaves his head, is always a bad sign, um, shows up at a rally, but he's thwarted. He's thwarted at the last minute by a Secret Service agent who recognizes that there's something up. And so he goes to Plan B, which is he goes to rescue the prostitute. Iris shows up uh, where she was staying and goes on a massive shooting rampage um, killing uh, her pimp, killing lots of the other people there, um, and um, it, it's a pretty Martin Scorsese kind of spectacle. Now, what's interesting is, spoiler alert, by the way, <laughs> my whole talk is a, is a trigger warning, spoiler alert, you know, smoothie. Um, so, uh, and then there's a sort of cryptic final scene where actually Travis, it turns out that he recovers and he goes back to driving a cab and, you know, and he has a nice conversation with, with Betsy, but, you know, you get this hint that his troubles are not over yet. Hinkley connected to this story like you wouldn't believe. I mean, seeing it 15 times. Um, and unlike uh, Travis Bickle, uh, Hinkley, his time in California does not have a happy ending. And he winds up leaving California in 1976 and moves back in with his parents. Um, tries college again, has a short return to California, back to Texas Tech. Um, and in the end, he spends seven years trying to get a college degree and doesn't get a degree and also really did not develop any meaningful friendships or any meaningful relationships. In contrast, this with your own experience in college. Um, at 24, he was um, a pretty distressed person. He bought his first handgun. Um, he said later that he played uh, Russian roulette with uh, real bullets. Um, obviously didn't shoot himself. Here's a picture he took of himself, which kind of appeared and disappeared very quickly. Um, he was having severe symptoms of anxiety, lots of somatic complaints, and he started buying more guns. Uh, it's not hard to buy guns in this country. Now, interestingly, his obsession with Jodie Foster kind of started around this time. And by this time, Jodie Foster is not the 12-year-old in the movie. Um, she's a real adult woman who uh, is getting a lot of attention for the fact that she's putting her acting career on hold to go to Yale. And um, a lot's been made about... Uh, you know, what was he thinking? But by this point, she was a lot less like Iris and a lot more like um, Daisy, the, the romantic obsession in um, uh, Taxi Driver. There were lots of articles. Here's one Andy Warhol did about Jodie Foster going to college. Um, Hinkley is reading everything he can about her, and he's also buying guns and going to the gun range. He, he uh, buys these what are called devastator bullets, which some people call exploding bullets. They don't really explode, but they're designed to fragment. Um, and a family practitioner in Lubbock gives him his first psychotropic medications. He's uh, served on a trimipramine, which is a, a tricyclic with some antipsychotic effects, as well as uh, a Valium for anxiety. Um, Then Hinkley gets this idea. Jodie Foster's going to Yale. Maybe I should ask my parents if I can take a writing course at Yale. Um, so even though he wasn't a student at Yale, he convinced his parents to let him take a course at Yale. 
And he started this six-month period of traveling and stalking uh, Jodie Foster. So he goes to uh, New Haven, and then, it's amazing you could do this, he, he calls her dorm and says, can I talk to Jody? You know, and they say, sure. And he actually succeeds in getting Jodie Foster on the phone in the dorm. Um, and she talks to him for a little bit, but it's really like, you know, please leave me alone. I don't really want a lot of attention like this. Um, and he started leaving her letters in her mailbox. And, you know, in the old days before email, you know, you wrote a piece of paper, and you fold it up, and you put it in a box, and then they would put it in someone's literal mailbox. And that's how you did the email in 1980. Uh, <laughs> you know, to check my box to see if anyone left a piece of paper for me. And uh, so he's doing that. And he did manage to have two conversations with her, but she smartly rebuffed him. Um, and after this re being rebuffed, he started what I call the assassination vacation, which was spending uh, this six-month sort of fever dream of traveling all over the country. Um, and it's hard to summarize it. I tried to use a, a U.S. map, but just to get a sense of it, he goes from New Haven, takes a train to Washington, D.C., and starts taking pictures of himself in front of things like the White House. That's not weird. Ford's Theater, where Lincoln was shot. Weirder. Um, and at the time, the president was not Reagan. The president was Jimmy Carter. Um, and Jimmy Carter is running for president because it's late 1980, and uh, it's a presidential year. Jimmy Carter is not a very popular president. And Hinckley starts to stalk Jimmy Carter. So Jimmy Carter goes to Ohio, to Dayton, Ohio. And Hinckley uh, later reports that... I'm just traveling all over the place. He goes to Lubbock, he buys some handguns, he goes back to D.C. Um, and he actually reportedly gets within 20 feet of Jimmy Carter at one of uh, Jimmy Carter's campaign stops in the state of Ohio, um, and apparently carrying a gun with him. Um, but he doesn't do anything about it. He goes back to New Haven, leaves some more notes for Jody Foster. October 6th, he flies to Lincoln, Nebraska, of all places. Well, you know what it was in Lincoln, Nebraska? The head of the American Nazi Party. Turns out Hinckley has some white supremacist viewpoints that hasn't gotten a lot of attention in his story. Um, but doesn't meet with him. Instead, he turns around, flies uh, three days later to Nashville. And in Nashville, he is actually uh, caught at the airport with guns. Now, it happens to be that Jimmy Carter is also in Nashville campaigning. Does this get on anyone's radar? Well, they do what you did in the old days. They took away his guns and said, don't do this. Um, and so he's now freed of his guns, so he's safe, right? Um, flies back from Nashville to New Haven, and then he goes to Dallas to visit his sister, um, goes back. It's this just incredible drifting period. Um, in 23 weeks before the shooting of President Reagan, um, he goes to his parents' house, and here's a significant psychiatric event. He overdoses on his medications. And this is the point where his family says, you need help. He's been drifting all over the country. He's been aimless for years. And they refer him to a psychiatrist named John Hopper. And Dr. Hopper, over the next few months, uh, sees Hinckley uh, a total of 12 times. And his impression of Hinckley, this is Dr. Hopper, an impression of Hinckley was that he's immature, he's spoiled, he's not mentally ill, he's not dangerous, and his recommendation was for the parents to kick him out of the house, cut off his money, and let him grow up. Um, and he got some criticism for that later on. Um, on November 4th, President Reagan was elected in a, a pretty big landslide, um, and um, Hinckley... A few weeks later, uh, flies to Washington, D.C. Now, it's interesting. Hinckley wrote a letter. I love this letter. He sends it to uh, <clears throat> a special agent of the FBI, and it says, <clears throat> there's a plot underway to abduct actress Jodie Foster from Yale University dorm in December or January. No ransom. She's being taken for romantic reasons. This is no joke. I do not wish to get further involved. Act as you wish. Um, that was a strange letter. Um, and um, he goes back to D.C. in the excitement following Reagan's election. And he's there in D.C. when a very major event happens in New York on December the 8th, 1980. Does anybody remember what happened? No. It's okay. It's cool. Uh, 
I wouldn't remember the day. John Lennon was assassinated uh, in front of his apartment at the Dakota. Um, he shot dead by a man named Mark David Chapman. Um, that's a topic for a whole new talk, uh, which won't happen today. But where do you think Hinckley goes next? Well, he goes to New York City. And 100,000 people join the John Lennon vigil. And Hinckley is one of the people at the vigil. And he's extremely upset about John Lennon. He's kind of obsessing about the John Lennon case. He's severely depressed. Um, and oh, also, New York's very close to New Haven, so he goes back to uh, Yale and leaves some more notes for Jodie Foster. Uh, but he's in this kind of despair following the uh, death of John Lennon. Flies home for Christmas, and then he decides to go back to New York City. Uh, and he's actually thinking about committing suicide. Um, and he doesn't commit suicide, but he stays in this sort of drifting state. And now we're leading up to seven weeks before the assassination. Um, he's back in New Haven again. He's just drifting. He uh, leaves another note for Jody Foster, essentially saying that he's going to commit suicide. He says, Jody, after tonight, John Lennon and I will have a lot in common. Um, but he... Uh, Apparently, it doesn't act on it. Um, decides to uh, emulate uh, Travis Pickle by going to New York to help some young prostitutes himself, um, and uh, goes to the Dakota Hotel where Lennon was shot, and he actually considered committing suicide at the exact spot that John Lennon was killed. Um, He's also reading books about presidential assassins. Here's one of his cards that wasn't mailed at the time. It's, on one side, it's got a picture of Ronald and Nancy Reagan. And on the other side, it says, Dear Jody, don't they make a darling couple? Uh, Nancy is downright sexy. One day you and I will operate, uh, occupy the White House, and the peasants will drool with envy. Until then, do your best to remain a virgin. You are a virgin, aren't you? Love, John. Um, that never works, by the way, uh, just FYI. Um, so we're getting very close to the assassination, flies back to Colorado, has his last appointment with uh, Dr. Hopper, um, sends another letter to Jody Foster. This letter says, um, where did it go? Let me see. This is what happens when your app is smarter than you are. It, it basically says, Jody, please wait for me. Could have spared us the slide for that. Let's see. There, no, no, not that. We're going to be at four weeks from the assassination. There it is. Jody. Ah, it did it again. Okay, just trust me. Um, it, uh, it's not anything she wants to read. Um, and then here's uh, her, his final letter to Jody Foster that he leaves for her on March the 6th, 1981. Jody, goodbye. I love you six trillion times. Don't you maybe like me just a little bit? It would make all the difference, John Hinckley. Um, he goes home. The father says, you are done. You can't uh, even stay at our house. You can stay in a hotel. Um, and he just spends the next few weeks in Denver hotels. He's watching TV. He's selling his guns to get money for food. He makes one last ditch uh, attempt to go to Hollywood to sell songs. But he decides in one day he's got to get back to D.C. He takes a cross-country bus. March 29th, he arrives in Washington, D.C. March the 30th, he sees President Reagan's schedule in the paper, writes the Dear Jody letter takes a cab to the D.C. Hilton and shoots him. So this is a very complicated history, but it kind of shows this is not your usual couple of months leading up to a crime. It's this incredible drifting uh, thing, and, and much of his trial was really uh, about um, what is the significance of this behavior in the shooting. Now, for most people who commit a crime, um, the defense is, I didn't do the crime. When you're caught red-handed doing the crime, holding the weapon in front of witnesses, pretty much your only legal strategy is the insane defense. So there was never really any question that the trial was going to be about Hinckley's mental state. And it, indeed it was. So it turns out that because of 
D.C. being the political seat of government, there had been a lot of insanity cases in Washington, D.C. And one of the very first insanity cases involved uh, President Trump's favorite former president, Andrew Jackson, uh, <coughs> who, um, as we know, uh, could not prevent the Civil War because uh, he's dead for 15 years. Um, President Jackson was at a funeral at the U.S. Capitol when a man named Richard Warren walked up to him and tried to shoot him with two guns that were in his pocket. Unfortunately, uh, the gun, the, the bullets had rolled out of the gun. In those days, you know, you kind of stuff the bullet in the gun. So click, click, nothing happens. Um, and what I'm told is, is that uh, Jackson actually started wailing on him with his cane saying, I know who sent you. Um, nobody had sent him. Um, Richard Lawrence was a pretty well-known uh, mentally ill guy who lived in the neighborhood. And just to make it even more celebrity filled, it was Francis Scott Key who was the DA, um, the guy that wrote the, the Star Spangled Banner. Now what's interesting is usually the DA is wanting to throw the, the, the book at the person, um, but in this case, Francis Scott Key, strangely, um, is saying, I trust when you've, I laid the evidence to you, um, you will extend every possible indulgence and liberality towards the prisoner. Um, uh, if when you've heard all the testimony, you should be the opinion that when he committed the offense, he was acting under delusional mind, that that delusion directed him to act, you'll find him not guilty. Now, why would the DA be doing this? Isn't the DA wanting to throw the, you know, throw the book at the person? <laughs> well, it turns out that in 1835, they'd never really thought about what the laws of D.C. should be. And at that time, um, there was no attempting to assassinate the President of the United States as a felony crime. It was a misdemeanor. <laughs> uh, attempted murder was a misdemeanor. And so if he had been found guilty, he would have been found guilty of a misdemeanor, and he would have been released pretty quickly. But if he was acquitted by reason of insanity, they could have kept him locked up pretty much forever. So the DA actually was advocating for insanity because that was really the hook to get him into uh, a much longer hospitalization. But if you look at this language, um, acting under a delusion of the mind, um, and that the delusion directed him to act, that is what we call irresistible impulse or a volitional test of insanity. And the timing of this lines up with a very major uh, case in Britain. Queen Victoria, um, who had a very long reign, um, had an assassination attempt in 1840 uh, by a guy named Edward Oxford, who took a, uh, a shot at her. Um, she actually had eight assassination attempts during her, her reign. Um, so she wasn't too happy <laughs> with this kind of behavior. Um, and in the trial of this man, Edward Oxford, um, the ruling was, or, or the order from the judge was that if some controlling disease was the acting power within him, which he could not resist, he would not be responsible. So this idea was irresistible impulse um, was the insanity standard. Um, but that really didn't last. And the case that really left an impact was, this is the case that you've heard about, is called the McNaughton case. And this was not an assassination attempt of Victoria, but actually um, he intended to kill the prime minister. Um, in those days, he didn't necessarily know what people looked like, and so he actually killed the wrong person, the prime minister's secretary, because the secretary was using the prime minister's carriage. And McNaughton uh, was a Scottish uh, wood turner, um, and he was actually acquitted quite quickly in his criminal trial, but there was so much outrage that they called together the law lords of Britain to come up with a consistent uh, insanity standard. And this was in 1844. And this standard uh, articulated into the law uh, a couple of concepts. One is that every person is presumed to be sane and responsible until the contrary be proved. And more importantly, um, from the non case, at the time of the act, the party accused was laboring under such a defective reason from disease of the mind as to not know the nature and quality of the act, or if he did know it, that he did not know what he was doing was wrong. So the idea was that, that it wasn't about irresistible impulse. McNaughton was really about, did you know at the time you committed the act, because of the disease of the mind, that the act was wrong? And this was the most influential criminal forensic case in the history of the world. Um, in the United States, this case was clearly established after the assassination of President James Garfield in 1881 by a man named Charles Gouteau. They applied the McNaughton standards. They found that he didn't understand the wrongfulness. He was actually hung. Um, 
And despite this fact, um, and by the way, it was the doctors that really killed uh, Garfield because they kept sticking their dirty fingers in his, uh, his wound. But that doesn't actually matter in criminal law. Um, so the toe was hung. And within the next 20 years or so, most jurisdictions in the U.S. adapted usually some kind of combination. So the McNaughton standard, but many of them would also include kind of a volitional arm also. Could you resist your actions? Um, and this perked along for a long time. But in Washington, D.C., in 1954, there was a Judge Bazelon who ruled that this approach to insanity was archaic, it was going back to the Victorian era, and it really did not take advantage of the knowledge and insight that mental health professionals could bring to the table. And so he passed an extreme, uh, or not passed, he, he ruled in this case an extreme liberalization of insanity, which has been called the product test. An accused is not criminally responsible if his unlawful act was the product of mental disease or defect. Now this was not ever popular or widely adapted. A few states adapted it, most did not. Um, but for several decades, D.C. was the uh, place that this standard was um, used. And it was never popular, it was rarely adopted, and Bazelon himself turned on it um, and became very disaffected with psychiatrists. And by 1972, there was a case called the Bronner case, which adapted in D.C. what most jurisdictions were already using, which some people call the American Law Institute test or the Model Penal Code test, which again is McNaughton combined with a volitional arm. A person is not responsible for criminal conduct if at the time of such conduct as a result of mental disease or defect he lacks substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct, so that sounds very McNaughton, or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law. And in D.C. they called this the Bronner Rule. Some people call it Model Penal Code or American Law Institute Standard. Some people even call it the Substantial Capacity Test. This was the legal standard under which John Hinckley was tried. So I want to break this down for you a little bit. Because in the law, words mean things. And one of the things you learn as an expert is that the precise legal definition of things is what you're held to. And where expert witnesses get in trouble is when they start using their own interpretations of the law or a dictionary definition of the law rather than the legal standard. So Hinckley was going to be tried with this standard. First of all, his behavior at the time of the conduct, that's what matters. What was happening that day when he did the shooting? Was there a mental disease or defect that caused him to lack substantial capacity to appreciate the wrongfulness of his conduct or to conform his conduct to the requirements of the law? Now, let's break this down. Mental disease or defect. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, it turns out that a lot of courts don't define mental disease or defect at all. And they do this for a reason, because they want the judge or the jury to determine what it actually is. So it's not synonymous with whatever is in the DSM. Now, D.C. had a very vague definition of mental illness, which was a mental disease or defect includes any abnormal condition of the mind which substantially affects mental or emotional processes and substantially affects behavioral controls. So any abnormal that affects either processes or controls. So the illness can affect the way you think or the way you act. Um, and also notice substantially, and that word um, is there on purpose. So it's not something that just might, you know, affect you minimally. It has to substantially affect your behavior. Um, appreciate the wrongfulness. So again, this is classic McNaughton. Although notice it doesn't say n no wrongfulness. It says appreciate wrongfulness. What's the difference between appreciate and no? Well, Hinckley's attorneys really seized on the word appreciate and said, look, the word appreciate actually kind of softens it. You might know that something is wrong, but you might not appreciate it because you're bombarded with all sorts of other things going on in your mind. So there's a lot of debate about the impact of the word appreciate. Um, and then conform conduct to the requirements of law. That's the classic volitional arm, irresistible impulse arm. So the trial. Well, there were lots of experts in this trial. Unfortunately, it was not videotaped or filmed. So other than these kind of occasional courtroom sketches, um, that's simply... Um, you don't have a lot of visual images of it. But there were lots of experts, as you would expect. And it's very complex going through the experts, but I've tried to simplify it a little bit. For the defense, 
Uh, there were four seasoned experts, and these were mostly experts who were experts in clinical issues more than forensic issues. William Carpenter, who was a schizophrenia researcher from the University of Maryland. Ernst Prellinger, who, uh, or no, this is David Baer from Harvard. He was a neuropsychiatrist, not a forensic psychiatrist uh, by training. There was Ernst Prellinger, a PhD from Yale. And finally, there was uh, Thomas Goldman, uh, another psychiatrist. Um, and these were all um, mid-career or later uh, seasoned clinician type mental health providers. The prosecution had a team of four. Um, there were two very seasoned forensic psychiatrists who they decided not to use as the testifying experts. As the testifying experts, they actually used uh, Park Dees, um, who uh, at that time was affiliated with Harvard. He was only 33 years old. Um, and um, Sally Johnson, who was in her very early 30s, who worked at the uh, Federal Detention Center in Butner, California. Um, and these were much more uh, part of the modern practice of forensic psychiatry. Um, and the difference in their approaches was very dramatic in this case. Um, and the prosecution and the defense in this case disagreed on everything. And one of the big criticisms of the Hinckley case is the um, battle of the experts. And it's really on display in this case. So they didn't agree on everything. So let's start with the diagnoses. Um, you know, in a lot of cases, the defense expert and the prosecution expert will agree on the diagnoses, but they may interpret things in a different way. But here, everything was up for grabs. Um, according to the prosecution experts, they felt that Hinckley was never actually psychotic. He did not meet the criteria for schizophrenia and never did. They diagnosed him with narcissistic personality disorder and schizoid personality disorder. The defense was really all over the map, but consistent with the idea that this was some kind of schizophrenia. Dr. Carpenter said process schizophrenia. Dr. Prolinger said ambulatory schizophrenia, borderline personality, and major depression. Um, Dr. Goldman said a simple schizophrenia and schizotypal personality. Uh, Dr. Baer uh, said so he was absolutely psychotic, um, had something in the schizophrenia spectrum disorder, and really focused on his CT scan. Now, for, for those of you that train in the uh, modern era, what is all this process, ambulatory, simple schizophrenia? What are all these diagnoses? You know, do you know the criteria for these diagnoses? Well, you have to understand that diagnosis was a little different then. Um, so we're used to DSM-5 and DSM-4, which focuses on criteria sets and a, and a fairly precise approach to diagnosis. But the DSM had only come out in 1980. This trial is in 1982. Now, how often do you still see someone using a DSM-4 diagnosis? I see it every day, and it's been almost four years. So it doesn't, it's, it's not surprising that a lot of people weren't being precisely using DSM-3. Uh, but the other thing is DSM-3 was really a revolutionary diagnostic system with very precise diagnosis. Its predecessor, DSM-2, was not as well used. Um, and the approach to diagnosis was definitely split. The prosecution was sticking to DSM-3 religiously. Um, the, pro the, the defense was using all sorts of diagnoses, research diagnoses. Um, now, simple schizophrenia actually was in the DSM-2. And when you hear the definition, it actually does kind of sound like Hinckley. Uh, this psychosis is characterized chiefly by a slow and insidious reduction of external attachments and interests and by apathy and indifference leading to impoverishment of interpersonal relations, mental deterioration, and adjustment on a lower level of functioning. Now that's the criteria. DSM-2 was really, it was a little more like when you get your paint chips at Home Depot and you're like holding up against the wall and you're saying, is this, you know, teal lavender or something else. It was a lot less precise. And we're used to the DSM-3, 4, 5 being strict criteria sets. But yeah, you could actually see how that might apply to somebody like Kingley, who was drifting and failed in college and had no relationships. Um, but there weren't precise criteria. Now, what about the symptoms and behaviors? It wasn't just that they disagreed on diagnosis. They didn't even agree on how to interpret his behavior. So, for example, Hinckley was an extremely lonely and isolated person, and the defense said that's evidence of a schizophrenia. The prosecution said that's evidence of his social ineptitude, his personality disorder. Um, he had these fantasies of fame, going to Hollywood, selling records, selling songs. The defense said he's delusional. He thinks that he can do all the stuff that he can't do. 
Prosecution said this is narcissism. He overvalues his accomplishments. And if any of you have ever been to L.A., it's full of people like this. <laughs> you, know? You, know? you know? You know, you go to a bagel shop in L.A., that person went there to be an actor. Um, I had a friend who spent years working in a bagel shop, you know, to, you know, have one walk on on a sitcom. He's now a very successful accountant. Um, <laughs> Cause he got the message, don't be an actor. Um, the attempt to publish music in Hollywood, which by the way, Charlie Manson also tried to be. Uh, the defense called that bizarre. Now I'm not sure why they called that bizarre. By the way, you know, season five dropped the word bizarre for this exact reason. Cause we all use bizarre in a, you know, bizarre is when you like eating aluminum foil cause you think you'll evolve into a metal bird. It's not, I want to be a rock star. Um, <laughs> So, um, so the prosecution said, look, he has normal hopes and dreams, but his expectations are totally unrealistic. So this back and forth and back and forth was, was really jarring. Now the interpretation of Taxi Driver was a very significant part of the play. They actually put it on the reel and played it for the jury. So that was like the highlight of the trial for the jurors. You at least got a movie in. You know, I got a movie out of it. Um, so they watched the movie Taxi Driver, and the defense said Hinckley was delusional. He actually thought he was Travis Bickle. He related with him to the point that he actually believed he was this person. Prosecution says no. He identified with him in an obsessive way. He identified with the alienation, the isolation. He imitated the actions of Bickle but he knew he was not him. The defense thought the whole you talking to me was even like an idea of reference, that Hinckley was actually thinking that De Niro was talking to him. And the prosecution said, no, that's not how we interpret it at all. Their interpretation was, guns make a weak person strong. And that's what Hinckley identified with. You feel weak, you feel cowardly, you have no power. A whole bunch of guns make you really powerful. And I think he kind of proved it in his way. Um, Travis Bickle in the movie had an imaginary girlfriend, and Hinckley himself was writing letters to his parents and describing an imaginary girlfriend um, that he probably picked up from that. The defense said he's delusional because he's describing this non-existent girlfriend. The prosecution says, no, he's just imitating the movie. He doesn't have his own ideas. He has to steal them from other sources. The obsession with Foster, the defense really focused on that. They said, this is bizarre. This is a sign of a thought disorder. Prosecution says he has incredibly bad judgment, but he always knew his chances were nil. If you look at his letters, especially the Dear Jody letter, he doesn't expect her to fall in love with him. He's saying, I want to show you how much I love you. I want to show you by this deed how much I feel for you. So they couldn't agree on anything. Um, now what about this magical mystery tour of travel? Because that is a pretty strange way to spend your time. Um, the defense said, and here's an actual quote from the defense, you look at the absolutely absurd travel pattern pursued by this man starting on September 17th and running all the way to March of 1981, on its face, it is irrational, purposeless, aimless. And what the prosecution said was, it is, but it takes a lot of organization to buy plane tickets, to make connections. And you know, this wasn't, this again, this is 1982, okay? There wasn't a Travelocity app on your phone. You know, if you wanted to buy a plane ticket, you had to talk to a person with your mouth. Uh, <laughs> you know, I need a ticket um, and, you know, have paper. So it did require a lot of planning to make all of these pieces happen. Um, so again, of course, a delusional person can also engage in very complex steps. And so it doesn't, in none of these things, does the truth have to be one side or the other. But the interpretation is very uh, exciting to read about in the transcripts. Um, now, what was interesting about Hinckley's case was this was one of the very first criminal trials in America where neuroimaging was a major issue. Um, and since Dr. Bender brought up uh, Leopold and Loeb, that was probably the very first trial. Now, what the hell neuroimaging were they doing in the 1920s? Well, what could you do in 1920? You could do a plain film of the skull. Well, what does that show you? Not much, except calcium. Well, what calcifies? Well, the pineal gland sometimes calcifies. So one of the Leopold Loeb killers, I think it was Loeb, uh, no, it was Leopold, um, had a calcification in his pineal gland, and they had a whole bunch of testimony about the implications of that. But that doesn't really say much. But by Hinckley's trial, the CT scan had become the standard of neuroimaging. Now, 
Um, CT was still pretty novel in the early 1980s. I remember when the first CT scan arrived in my home state. Um, in 1981, there were only 13 CT scans in the entire United States um, and no MRI. Um, Hinckley's, this is not Hinckley's CT scan, by the way. I could not find it. Um, but his CT scan was abnormal. It showed widened sulci. It showed enlarged ventricles. And the defense wanted to introduce this as evidence, not necessarily diagnostic of schizophrenia, but not inconsistent with the other stuff they were saying. Prosecution was strongly opposed to this. They said this is going to confuse the jury. This is going to you know, wow the jury with some you know, super technology. It doesn't really say anything. And it went back and forth. One of the defense experts actually told the judge, I refuse to testify unless you allow it. And the judge said, you're going to go to jail if you try that. And that cooled him down. Um, and finally, the judge decided to admit this testimony, and they had about a day of testimony about the significance of this. And um, it went back and forth, and um, on the defense side, um, they said, we've done a lot of scans at St. Elizabeth's Hospital, and about a third of patients diagnosed with schizophrenia have similar results, and only about 2% of normal people showed this finding. The prosecution brought in several other radiologists. Some of them said that they don't even look abnormal. Uh, other radiologists said it is abnormal, but it's an abnormal normal variant, if you know what I mean. Uh, it doesn't have clinical significance. And at the end of the day, there's a lot of debate about how much did this impact the jurors. I don't think it had a huge impact on the jury, but nobody really knows. Um, so again, defense consistent with schizophrenia. Um, prosecution gave a little bit of ground and said maybe it does show some abnormalities but in a criminal insanity trial the issue is not the scan it's whether or not their mental disease or defect prevented them from understanding the criminality of their actions or their ability to conform their conduct some people have asked whether Hinckley was malingering um, well I don't think he was malingering the CT scan you know I mean try to wipe your own cell side <laughs> hard. Um, <laughs> got to go get the scan now. Um, so the defense didn't even suspect it. Um, they argued that if he was malingering, he would have been more dramatically malingering. He would have said, I heard voices and the voices told me to shoot Reagan, or I had visions and the visions told me. And that's a good point, because people who malinger usually overplay their hand. Um, the prosecution um, didn't ever diagnosed him with malingering, but they were very critical of the fact that apparently the defense gave Hinckley a copy of the DSM criteria for schizophrenia and said, just go over this and let us know if you have any of these symptoms. Um, and they actually would give Hinckley copies of the defense experts' reports and ask him for sort of editorial input. Is this right? Is this wrong? And on paper that might sound okay, but you know, you're kind of training your witness to know what the strategy is. Um, Hinkley had a book in the hotel room, and in the book it was about a, one of the books was about a skyjacker who lingered psychosis after he got caught. Again, don't think that was very significant in that case. Um, and some of Hinckley's interviews actually happened well into the trial, which was criticized. But I don't think there was any real evidence of malingering. Cognitive arm, I'm going to go very quickly through this. This is the heart of any kind of insanity analysis. Do they actually meet the legal criteria? Um, do they appreciate the wrongfulness of their actions? Well, the prosecution said, look, his letter to Jody Foster says it all. You know, he expected to be shot. He expected to be killed. He knew he was committing an illegal act. He concealed the weapon. He wasn't like showing the gun off to the reporters. You know, he kept it hidden. Why would you hide a weapon? Because you know you might get stopped. You might be caught. Um, he expected to be killed or captured. Um, and when he was stalking Jimmy Carter, he actually had a diary talking about his plans. But after he had those guns confiscated, he destroyed the diary. Now, that's not really his mental state necessarily for Reagan, but it shows that in a previous circumstance, he was aware that you kind of need to cover up some evidence. Now, the defense took the strategy that he might have had intellectual awareness of the criminality, but they focused on this word, appreciate the criminality. This was a troubled, disturbed person traveling all over the country, thinking he can impress this movie star. Um, he didn't have the emotional understanding. So that's where they fell on that. Now, the volitional arm, 
is interesting. Many jurisdictions don't have any volitional arm. California doesn't have a volitional arm. But the issue is, can you conform your conduct to the requirements of the law? The defense approached this in a very diffuse way. They said that all the anchors that hold a normal person to reality, friendships, relationships, connections with jobs, family, children, he had lost all of those. He had lost everything that would tether him to the world. And he was also suicidal. If you're planning to die, who cares what the consequences of your actions are? The prosecution focused very specifically on the factual issue. They said, look, he had carried a gun with him on many other occasions and didn't shoot, you know, when he was stalking Jimmy Carter. He had the ability to pull the gun in or out if he wanted to. He didn't have anything telling him to commit the crime, no command hallucinations. Um, he actually could have shot Reagan as Reagan went into the Hinkley. He was there at the beginning, but it wasn't really an opportune time. So he hung out until Reagan was leaving, and that was considered evidence. Um, what's interesting about this case is that really the verdict all comes down to the jury instructions. And I'm going to very quickly go through this concept of standard of proof, which is very confusing. So everybody knows from watching CSI that... Um, the prosecution has to prove the case beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, and in civil cases, you usually only have to prove by a preponderance of the evidence. Um, in things like civil commitments or termination of parental rights, you have to prove by what's called clear and convincing evidence, which is like 75%. Um, and then in a criminal case, the prosecution has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what about the insane defense? Well. There was some debate. In some jurisdictions, you raise the insane defense, you have to prove you were insane. And, but in other jurisdictions, if the insane defense was raised, the prosecution had to prove you weren't insane. And that's what the judge in this case said. He told the jury the burden is on the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt. If the government has not established this to your satisfaction, beyond a reasonable doubt, you shall bring a verdict of not guilty by reason of insanity. And so, think about this. In a case where you have to um, convince the jury you're insane, um, you have got all the work. But in a case where the prosecution is to prove you're insane, the prosecution has got all the work. And it's a lot easier um, to disprove insanity than to prove sanity. Um, and so, just as an example, Let's say that after all the information, Hinckley's jury was, I don't know, 35% convinced he was insane. Well, if Hinckley had had the burden to prove his own insanity, that's not good enough. They need to be convinced, more likely than not, that he was insane. If they're only partially convinced, it's not going to be successful. But if the prosecution has to disprove his sanity, then the defense thinking is, well, I'm 35% convinced he's insane. Well, that's enough because he has to be sane beyond a reasonable doubt. So one of the myths of the Hinckley case is that it was all about all these other issues. But in the end, the jury instructions were, if you're not convinced beyond a reasonable doubt that he's sane, you must acquit him. And that's the part of the story that's almost never mentioned in the media or in the history books, but it really came down to who had the burden of proof. And in this case, the burden of proof was on the prosecution. And the jury concluded that they failed. Now, does anyone remember the riots after Hinckley's acquittal? Well, there weren't any. Um, but <laughs> there was a lot of negative media coverage. Um, Hinckley beats the rap. Uh, there's outcry. And of course, who's blamed for this? Psychiatry. Um, yeah, because, you know, it's our fault, right? Um, so there was a lot of uh, legal scholarship written on this. Here's a great quote from the University of Chicago Law Review. Uh, the instructions amounted to a directed verdict of, of not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, juries usually ignore such unpopular legal standards, but the Hinckley jury surprised everyone by taking the law seriously. Um, there was this an enormous reaction. Now, the executive branch was very upset. Now, they had a bit of a conflict of interest, given that the president was shot. Um, and uh, but they were very critical of the verdict. Um, the attorney general actually wanted to appeal the verdict and eliminate the insane defense. Um, but the, the, the executive branch kind of backed down and said, let's let the system work. Um, Congress, on the other hand, 
really took it seriously. And they had lots of hearings, both in the House and the Senate, on the insane defense. Uh, the hearing for the Senate was called limiting the insane defense. So what do you think they, uh, their strategy was? Um, five of the jurors were actually called to testify to Congress, which I think is a very banana republic. You know, we don't like the verdict, so we're going to call you to testify to Congress. Um, and there were actually 25 different bills introduced to limit the, the offense. Now, this has gotten a little overplayed. There was a lot of negative attitudes about uh, insanity already. On the um, several days before Reagan was shot, there was actually a bill introduced to eliminate the federal insane defense. So it wasn't like the, this did it all. But in the end, the federal government passed for federal courts the Insane Defense Reform Act of 1984. They got rid of the volitional arm and they made it a strict McNaughton standard. They shifted the burden of proof to the defendant. They raised the standard of proof to clear and convincing. The so now the defendant has to prove that they are insane by clear and convincing evidence. They banned what was called ultimate issue testimony by expert witnesses. And they added the word severe to mental illness. There's been a lot of debate about whether any of this actually made a difference in uh, acquittals. It only applied to federal courts. It didn't even apply to the D.C. Superior Court, which was the most common place in D.C. where people were tried. Um, nationally, lots of states followed suit. Um, it was never easy to be found insane, but now it's harder. Lots of states replaced this model penal code test with the right-wrong standard, just like the federal. A lot of states shifted the burden of proof to the defendant. Lots of states adopted a new thing called guilty but mentally ill. Um, some states actually completely eliminated the insane defense. Uh, Montana, Nevada, there's several states that don't have it at all. Now, what about California? Um, now, California uh, is an interesting state because it actually has ballot initiatives that you vote on that can change the Constitution or the statutes. And there was a California Victims' Bill of Rights in the summer of 1982. And what this bill did uh, was it eliminated the volitional prong in favor of the McNaughton standard. Um, it also eliminated something called uh, diminished capacity, which was a very unpopular defense, especially after the assassination of Harvey Milk and Mayor Moscone uh, here in the city. Um, but one of the myths that I've heard is, is that the, the Hinckley case verdict um, was responsible for this. It wasn't. The vote was on June 8, 1982. The Hinckley verdict was two weeks later, uh, June 21st, 1982. So the California voters voted on this during the Hinckley trial, but they did not know the outcome. There was a national swing. The fact that Reagan was president, I think, kind of shows there was a national swing uh, in a more conservative direction, and states were um, responding in, in kind. So what happens? This is the slide I just did. That's funny. That's easy. Clicks. Um, so what happens? There was a, part of the outcry was this idea that Hinckley was going to get released within 50 days. Well, he didn't get released in 50 days. He was sent to um, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., which was not a pleasant place. This is the John Howard Pavilion. For many years, my office was right by that car. Um, Hinkley would take care of the cats, the feral cats on the grounds, and be right outside that window. One time I was actually giving a Hinkley lecture, and I looked out the window, and there he was. Um, but uh, he didn't hear me. It was just where the cats were. Um, what happened to John Hinkley? Well, in the early days, 1983 to 1987, he was a very difficult patient, very manipulative, still preoccupied with fame, still preoccupied with Jody Foster. 1987, he tried to get passes. The court refused because it turned out that he was still trying to communicate with serial killers and write letters to Jody Foster. From 1987 to 1999, he started to improve. He started to mature. He actually got a girlfriend who helped him mature tremendously and um, become more of an adult. And by 1999, the courts had ruled that he was eligible for day passes with his family. Uh, by 2005, he was granted overnight passes. Um, and from 2009, he was getting 10-day passes uh, that were overnight uh, 12 times a year. And by this point, I was actually, I started working at St. Elizabeth's in around 2006, and I was part of a, a group of people that were involved with the risk assessment process. Um, but ultimately, it was really another battle of the experts in the hearings, and the hospital recommendations were not um, majorly considered um, as the primary issue. Um, by 2013, he had 17-day overnights. Um, finally, he was released in September of 2016. So he just got out. 
Uh, he's living in Williamsburg, Virginia with his elderly mother, uh, occasionally hounded by paparazzi, if you can believe that. Uh, Secret Service, I'm sure, is still following him. For the most part, he shows uh, no violent behavior, also appears to just want to be left alone. All right. Thank you. And um, I'm very happy at this point to take questions on the case. Yes, sir. So, um, so Dr. Hopper, who had evaluated him, um, did testify in the trial, and then later he was sued by uh, several of the victims, although I don't think Reagan himself was part of that lawsuit, but he was sued uh, civilly for um, incompetent care. Um, I don't believe the suit was successful, um, although it may have settled, but there was a lot of... You know, there's a lot of hindsight bias uh, that you have in these cases, but if you look at every person in the country that behaves like a John Hinckley at that point, who is withholding from their doctor certain key information, like guns and fantasies of killing people, um, it's hard to know how Dr. Hopper probably could have predicted or prevented it. So even though he got some criticism, um, it, it wasn't like Hinckley was sharing a lot of his intent with anybody, uh, certainly not with anybody clinically. Some people were very critical of the kind of tough love approach. Um, and again, if you, if you look at it from the defense perspective, um, some of the defense experts just flat out called the care Hinckley was getting malpractice. So from their perspective, um, it was incompetent care. Uh, from the prosecution's perspective, this might be how you treat somebody with a personality disorder who needs to have some maturity. So in the end, Hopper, you know, I, I wouldn't say he was vindicated, but he didn't, it didn't end him either. Yes, sir? I'm curious about the letter to the Secret Service warning them of a plot against a dirty boss. In hindsight, do you think that the VIP could have been considered? And what that kind of Um. Well, there were certainly variables uh, that, that did exist. I mean, um, um, you find dissociative identity. Uh, I mean, you know, Sybil, the book Sybil and Three Faces of Eve were certainly around. I don't think anyone diagnostically ever um, diagnosed Hinckley with uh, any kind of dissociative phenomenon. What was interesting about his letters were that it doesn't look like anybody took it very seriously. I mean, even though the fact, I mean, even though he's leaving letters for Joan Foster um, that could have been traced back to him, uh, a lot of the things that he was sending, you know, like the uh, anonymous tip that she was going to be um, kidnapped, I don't think it was on anyone's real radar. And, and, you know, with all these cases, I mean, this happened a lot with the JFK assassination, the Secret Service is really criticized after the fact. And probably the biggest criticism after the fact is the fact that he got shot where he did, when he did, when there were all these security guards. Um, and uh, there's a book that came out a few years ago called Rawhide Down that gets a lot more into those aspects of Reagan's uh, security detail. Um, but most of Hinckley's attention was on Jodie Foster. Um, and the, the, the stalking literature was not mature at all at that time. And I think that if this case happened now, you would have a lot of experts on stalking uh, that would talk about different typologies of stalkers. Um, and they would probably look at this case as uh, sort of an incompetent, immature stalker. Um, but at that time, there was really almost no stalking literature. And so the behavior was looked at almost completely in the context of depression or psychosis. Um, but it's interesting about um, um, the, the agreement on the diagnosis was interesting because the hospital ultimately gravitated to a diagnosis much closer to the prosecution's point of view. Um, and by the way, none of this is, is, this is all stuff that's in the public record, but in the last 20 years of his hospitalization, his diagnosis and his chart that was always mentioned in the um, hearings was narcissistic personality disorder major depressive disorder in remission 
and psychotic disorder not otherwise specified in remission, which I guess means we don't know what he had and he doesn't have it anymore. Um, <laughs> psychotic disorder not otherwise specified in remission is a pretty, a pretty vague thing. Um, so in the end, the hospital really went with the prosecution's formulation, even though they were battling the prosecution on the release because the hospital wanted him released for about the last 20 years of his hospitalization. Um, but there was actually not a lot of debate about his psychiatric diagnosis during his release hearings. Uh, it, I attended a lot of his release hearings and never once did it come up that he was currently psychotic uh, or that he'd even had a severe depression since the 1980s. All of the focus was on narcissistic personality. Yes, in the back. Um, most certainly. Actually, it's fascinating to read the uh, the hearings because it's a big, big tome. Um, uh, a lot of the it was a, like today, it was an extremely politicized event. Um, Washington, D.C. Um, is a majority African-American city. It was even more so a majority African-American city in 1980. And uh, traditionally voted extremely Democratic. So Reagan lost by a larger margin in the District of Columbia than anywhere else. And so there was a lot of politicization that this jury, which was a majority African-American jury, might have been biased by their political... Uh, orientation towards Democrats to favor John Hinckley. Now, it was an, an absurd argument. John Hinckley was a, was a conservative Republican himself. His family came from conservative Republicans. He was, in fact, at one point, toying with white supremacy. Um, and the fact that he shot Reagan was because Reagan was the famous person he could shoot that day. If, if it had been J Paul McCartney, he would have probably shot Paul McCartney. If it had been Jimmy Carter, he would have shot Jimmy Carter. So this was a very non-political crime from the perspective of the shooter. So that was one aspect of it, was sort of this Republican Congress uh, politicizing a D.C. jury. But they were also very condescending to the jury about, did you really understand the instructions? Did you really understand what the judge said? Um, and it's a, it's a little unseemly to see how somebody is, uh, you know, is serving their community by being on a jury, and then they get you know, put through the ringer by, um, by the senators. So to me, it's kind of an unpleasant read. What is useful in the hearings is that some nationally known, respected experts in forensic psychiatry uh, testified on things that hold up today about prediction of dangerousness, about issues related to different uh, insanity standards. Um, so it's illuminating when you read about what experts thought should be the law, and it looks like a witch hunt when you look at the uh, approach to the jury. Yes, ma'am. You got a question? Oh, I was curious. Great question. So Hinckley's medication regimen is something that's a little bit of a challenge to discern because it's never discussed in many of these cases. Um, he w was put on medications early in his hospitalization, uh, some kind of antidepressants. He actually gave a secret interview to Penthouse Magazine uh, by mail um, or maybe phone call, and he would refer to uh, you know, the hospital where they give you terrible food and delicious medications. Um, but, and he had a suicide attempt um, uh, within a year or two after uh, um, the crime. Um, so he had been treated with some antidepressants early on. Then he got off of the medications, and he spent a long time, I think he spent about 12 years on no medications of any kind. And what's interesting is the decision to put him back on medications um, because um, there was a period in the 90s where there was some controversy about whether or not he was stalking a, a hospital pharmacist. Um, he definitely got interested in the woman who was a, a, a member of the hospital pharmacy, and there was a lot of debate about are these eerie parallels to the crime, or is this a lonely guy locked up in a mental hospital who's flirting with you know, whoever he can. Um, so at some point, I think in the late 90s, um, they put him uh, back 
uh, on an antipsychotic, an atypical antipsychotic. He was put on uh, Geodon. And that's in the court record where they say we decided to put him back on a medication. And, and when you read the transcript where they discuss it, um, and I'm, I'm deliberately avoiding hospital chart and notes, but if you look at the stuff that's in the public record, there's no target symptoms that are mentioned. It was just this sort of, you know, well, we thought we'd see if he would do better with medications. And then it would come up in subsequent hearings, and it's like, well, ever since we put him on medications, he seems to be doing better. Um, and I remember one stack of past hearings where it was a week of testimony. This was in the early 2000s, and, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pages. And the entire discussion of medications was like two paragraphs. And it was just, yeah, we started on this medication, and it seems like uh, since he's been on the medication, he's doing a lot better. Some people have interpreted this as the judge is not going to ever release him from the hospital if he's not on anything. And some people have interpreted this as sort of this sort of cynical, well, we're arguing he's recovered from some severe psychotic disorder, depressive disorder, and yet he's on no medication. How do we know he's not going to relapse and do something terrible? But there's nothing in the uh, court testimony that really gives any illumination about why he's on medication, what the target symptoms were, the extent to which the target symptoms were reduced. He was just put on the medication, and he was doing better, and nobody wants to mess with it. So um, Citizens Commission for Human Rights, our friends, the Scientologists, uh, actually have a, a bit, uh, a thing on uh, Geodon is a terrible drug and Hinckley was put on it, so that's part of your evidence of what a horrible drug it is. And that was something that they did recently based on uh, his release hearings. But the medications are not very uh, illuminating. And the same is true with uh, actually sophisticated evidence-based approaches towards violence risk, that um, in the hearings, you know, he would, he would, you know, he, he had undergone things like the hair psychopathy test, and he had undergone actuarial measures of future dangerousness. And in the release hearings, that would be uh, of minimal interest. And what would be much more of interest was what TV shows did he watch, what books did he look at. He got passes for many years, and the Supreme, I mean, and the Secret Service would follow him and take notes on the books he looked at. Uh, one story I recall was that uh, Hingley was at a bookstore and there's a, 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 a biography of Ronald Reagan called, I think it was called Dutch, and he's like looking in the book, like is he looking for his name in the, in the index? I'm sure it was there, right? Um, it's probably what I would have done. Um, and, but, but, and the prosecution seized upon the most trivial aspects of it. So for example, in the back of the book, there's a picture of Reagan waving. Well, Reagan was waving when he was shot by Hinckley. His arm was up in the air, and that's how he managed to catch the bullet where he did. And that became an entire topic of conversation on the release hearing, that Hinckley was looking at a picture of Reagan with his hand in the air, just like Reagan had his hand in the air when um, Reagan was sh shot. Well, Google President waving, <laughs> and you're going to see like paintings of George Washington waving, and Andrew Jackson waving, and every president waving, and the Pope waving. Um, everybody waves. If you're a celebrity, you wave. So, you know, the release hearings were much more on kind of the gotcha aspects of, um, is he listening to violent music? What are the lyrics? Oh, he wrote some new songs. Let's look at the lyrics of those songs. Um, and the truth is, is that our evidence-based methods of risk aren't really designed for a John Hinckley. I mean, if you look at the man's entire life, the only time he was ever actually violent to anyone else was just this one, you know, one minute period. Um, he had never, you know, he had attempted suicide, but he had never been violent to anybody else. And so it's hard to sort of approach the dangerousness the way we usually approach it in our business when someone's only history of dangerousness was just this one period where they just happened to shoot four people, including the President of the United States. Other than that, you know, other than that, no dangerousness. Yes, ma'am. Um, goodness. Um, I'm just going to say I think okay. Um, <laughs> I used to know this answer cold. Um, um, you know, he had, um, um, he didn't have any history of 
the sort of predatory issues that, you, you know, he wasn't torturing animals, he wasn't, uh, expo I mean, other than maybe taking advantage of his parents' generosity. Um, so he had, he, so, you know, he had some unstable lifestyle issues, but he wasn't somebody that had shown, like, the psychopathic criminal behavior. He really didn't have a criminal history other than the stuff he did with Reagan. I wish you'd probably stop now. Thank you so much.